Hello, everybody. Welcome to ITIF's webinar, Fostering User Safety in AR VR Technology. My name is Juan Londoño, and I am ITIF's Augmented and Virtual Reality Policy Analyst. And today I have a privilege to be alongside an amazing group of panelists and speakers. Augmented and virtual reality has the potential to improve people's day-to-day -day lives, offering the possibility of attending virtual fitness classes, playing immersive video games, hosting fantastic entertainment events, educating a workforce, and even more. But it also opens a wide range of physical, psychological, and financial threats, from distracted driving to harassment or even ransomware. While many of ARVR's user safety issues are similar to that we find in other digital technologies, such as smartphones or video games, the immersive nature of the content display in ARVR can amplify threats and introduce new complexities. Therefore, making ARVR technology safe to use and giving, the, the tool, giving them the tools and training they need to stay safe should be a priority for both companies and policymakers. Addressing user safety in ARVR will require coordination and cooperation from various stakeholders, from hardware manufacturers and online platforms to users and then policymakers as well. While some of these stakeholders already have various tools to create a safe environment in ARVR, imagine content moderation tools or mute buttons for users, public policy will have a key role in, their, in, in determining the effectiveness of these tools in tackling potential harm. Before we kick off this discussion, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Australian eSafety Commissioner, Julie Inman Grant. Julie Inman Grant is Australia's eSafety Commissioner. In this role, Commissioner Grant leads the world's first government regulatory agency committed to keeping its citizens safer online. She has extensive knowledge in the nonprofit and government sectors and spent two decades working in senior public policy and safety roles in the tech industry. The commissioner also serves on the World Economics Forum Global Coalition for Digital Safety and on their XR Eco Gover Ecosystem Governance Steering Committee on Building and Defining the Metaverse. Commissioner, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's very early up there. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us today for this, uh, for this panel and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Juan, and thank you everyone for turning in. It is just on 5 a.m. I can't promise I'll be my best, but I'll, I'll do the very best I can. It's really great to be with you here today, virtually at least, to take part in this really important discussion about user safety in AR and VR environments and the ways that governments, regulators, and industry can really work together to prioritize the safety of users in all future, future versions of the metaverse. So the metaverse, Web3, and now AI are collectively being touted as the next great online revolution. And generative AI is certainly sweeping over us like a tsunami. This means that now, more than at any other moment since the earliest days of the internet, we have a unique opportunity to shape this new online environment with safety at its core. But to create a safer future, we must first make sure we we are not just repeating the mistakes of our Web 2.0 past. It's no longer good enough to just sit back and wait to see how things play out in this new online frontier. We need to be anticipating, identifying, and engineering out potential misuse to prevent these future harms from occurring in the first place. Next slide, please. It wasn't all that long ago that the internet was in its infancy and the world was still very much in an analog state. It was a time of great promise, and it was also a time when many thought overregulation would be an impediment to innovation and growth. Tech companies were moving fast and breaking things and wanted only one thing from governments, to stay out of their way. And for the most part, governments around the world were happy to oblige. I know this time well, having worked at Tech Policy Ground Zero, as I call it, in 1995, as a young Washington DC lobbyist for Microsoft. You can see it's the um, early 90s. I had big ideals and even bigger hair. At the same time, it was Microsoft, AOL, CompuServe, Novell, and Netscape were at the big end of town at that time. And looking to the future through our rosy techno-utopian glasses, we only had eyes for the potential this online revolution would bring. But with rapid advances in technology and computing power just around the corner, the internet we were preparing for would quickly outpace all of our imaginations. Next slide. 
The rapid evolution of this early Web 1.0 world to the 2.0 version we all now know today has been truly astounding. Today's internet really is an amazing place, bringing humanity so many benefits. Still scratch my head wondering how we would all have continued to work, learn, and connect over the past few years during this terrible pandemic as the social world we all had taken for granted disappeared almost entirely overnight. And when I think back to those early days back in the 1990s, the internet was still a bit of a novelty. Today, I'd argue it has become an essential utility. Slide. So the world now sits on the cusp of the next great internet revolution as we hurtle headlong into Web 3.0 world and start exploring new realities in the metaverse. I believe we have a once in a generation opportunity here to learn from our many Web 2.0 mistakes when building this new version so that safety takes its rightful place as the third pillar of digital trust alongside privacy and security. But before I delve further into these emerging digital worlds, I wanna give you a little insight into who eSafety is and how we fit into this picture. Next slide. Now in 2015, eSafety became the first government regulator in the world solely dedicated to keeping its citizens safe online. Eight years ago, there was no playbook for how online safety regulation and addressing online safety complaints would be handled. So we've had to fill in the pages as we've gone along. Now our approach is multi-pronged and includes a model we like to call the three Ps. The first is prevention. And through our research, education, and awareness raising programs, we strive to prevent online harms from happening in the first place. Our second P is protection. And we operate a number of world first schemes under Australia's Online Safety Act, which deal with the cyberbullying of children, serious online abuse of adults, the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and videos, uh, known co colloquially as revenge porn, but we refer to it as image-based abuse because the lexicon matters. We also deal with illegal content like child sexual abuse material and pro-terror content. So we serve as Australia's hotline, just like the uh, National Center for Missing Exploited Children in the US. Now, through these complaints-based regulatory schemes, we support individuals in the grip of a personal online crisis by compelling social media platforms and websites to take down abusive and harmful content within 24 hours if it meets the legislative threshold. But in 90% of cases, we are able to work directly with the platforms when it violates their terms of service or our legal thresholds to take that, that um, violative content down voluntarily. So our third P is what I call proactive and systemic change. And eSafety is trying to lead the global charge to shift more safety responsibility back onto the tech sector. We want them to assess risks and incorporate safety into every aspect of how they design, develop, and deploy their products and services. And we call this safety by design. I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail in a minute because it's key to entrenching safety into any future versions of the metaverse. Next slide, please. Like all groundbreaking tech, the metaverse has the potential for enormous good. Imagine this powerful new technology taking children back in time to experience the sights, the sounds, and the sensations of ancient Rome, or what it might feel like to walk amongst the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. There are also some incredible applications in training, allowing people to practice skills virtually. Imagine future medical students studying and dissecting virtual human bodies. Well, I guess not all of us have the stomach for that, but um, it's a great advancement in health. Nevertheless, the metaverse also has the potential to improve the quality of life and independence for people with a disability or those with mobility restrictions. Next slide. But in highlighting the potential benefits, we must also consider the risks. The reality of how this new online world is sadly the same as the current one. And I think we can expect to see some types of threats in the future metaverse as we see online today. And while there will still be content children cannot unsee, it's really the conduct, particularly in dark private spaces that will be the most cause for concern. Harassment, abuse, and cyberbullying are likely to have a far more visceral impact in more immersive environments especially on children, as these digital experiences become more and more lifelike. 
Immersive technologies also have the potential to shape new harms. Combining a physical sensation through haptics with the visual and oral dimension of VR. Imagine the risk to children of wearing a virtual reality headset where a parent can't look over their shoulder to see what they're seeing or experiencing. Now, let's say a child is exploring the metaverse from their bedroom wearing a haptic suit where they have full sensory feeling across their bodies. A future could exist where they could be groomed and physically or sexually assaulted in the metaverse while their parents remain unaware in the next room. And I think that if we see some online games are violent now, think about what the experience would be when you're wearing a full sensory haptic suit and feeling the simulated pain of a bullet wound. These are hyper-realistic, high sensory experiences that may one day be almost indistinguishable from the real thing with the potential to inflict real harm and significant trauma. Next slide. So how do we prepare? Safety by design is key and the companies building the metaverse have the responsibility to install the right digital guardrails to ensure people can use their corner of the metaverse safely. And we at uh, eSafety have spent the past five years working with industry to lead them down a path that will fundamentally change how they design, develop and deploy their products with safety at the core and we've created tools and a set of principles and risk assessment tools they can use to achieve that. Industry also needs to start thinking about how to establish effective reporting pathways for abuse in the metaverse when things inevitably go wrong. Companies like Meta have started looking at a personal boundary approach as a way to address harassment in this virtual reality space, Horizon Worlds. The idea is to create a one meter exclusion zone around your avatar for not non-friends by default. It seems like a good solution, but will it be enough? And can it be circumvented? Perhaps we also need an eject button that gets you out of trouble and out of the metaverse fast. A metaverse for kids and safe spaces for marginalized groups are other ideas already on the table. And mirroring or casting technology is being considered so that parents can see what their children are seeing behind the headsets. But I do worry that the costs of these technologies may be cost prohibitive for some, and we want to ensure that there isn't a digital safety divide in the future. Depending on what form the metaverse takes, some basic town planning will undoubtedly be very important. You, know, you don't build a city in the desert without knowing where your water sources are going to be, where you're going to put your green spaces, and where the sewage will be running. We want to plan for safe and habitable spaces where we put our bollards in and our crosswalks. Uh, we've got to plan with the fundamental building blocks for the future in the metaverse in the same way. I mean, we don't want the Lego land for kids sitting across the virtual street from a sexy land catering to adults. And if children do venture into the wrong part of town, what sort of virtual bouncers are on hand to prevent them from entering adult premises and being exposed to inappropriate content and conduct? Now, some form of age verification or age assurance will likely need to be part of the conversation too. In addition to shielding children from content they aren't cognitively or developmentally ready for, any age assurance solution must also balance the imperatives of privacy and security. So this leads to the question of anonymity in the metaverse, and this will also likely be a controversial issue. Whether or not your avatar will be linked to your identity and provide you with a transferable online identity is another issue the architects of the metaverse will need to resolve. Even in today's Web 2.0 world, anonymity both serves to protect people in vulnerable situations while enabling others to dish out abuse with relative impunity. If your virtual identity is traveling across the metaverse, some might propose needing a virtual passport so that people always know who they're dealing with. Metaverse platforms will need to consider how to harness the safety, privacy, and free expression benefits of maintaining the degree of anonymity, while also ensuring it isn't used as a tool for abuse. Slide. Now, regulation will also play a role. E-safety's powers already apply to early metaverse services like Horizon Worlds, VR Chat, Roblox, and Fortnite. We're also actively thinking about what regulation will be required as immersive technologies becomes more accessible and where changes or different approaches might be needed. 
Under Australia's new Online Safety Act, we've been given powerful new tools to compel online services to report their aunt to us on what they're doing and not doing to keep their users safe. These basic online safety expectations will keep industry's feet to the fire to make sure that they're making their services, including those in the metaverse, as safe as possible. These are really important transparency compulsion tools. The online industry in Australia is also in the process of developing new industry codes designed to address the risk of illegal and restricted online content. These codes will also apply to devices and to metaverse services slide. But a small regulator in Australia cannot hope to shape the metaverse alone, and that is why a fourth P, partnerships, is also important. Along with our own world-leading online safety act, there are now several important pieces of legislation around the world designed to protect citizens online and hold providers of digital services to account. This includes Ireland's online safety and media regulation act where we now have an online safety commissioner the uk's proposed online safety bill and important work underway in canada new zealand and singapore and of course the recent political agreement between the european parliament and eu member states on the digital services act deserves a special mention this is an inflection moment in europe and the world and a milestone we're celebrating globally the very fact that authorities are thinking about online harms and safety regulation in a similar way fills me with a great deal of optimism for the future and hope that we can create a safe and inclusive metaverse for all. And, and I'll also add that innovation has not been stifled to date. So we need to get that balance right. In conclusion, the last slide, I think the answer to the trillion dollar question of what the metaverse will look like and how it will operate is still not fully known. It may very well end up with one huge universe with total interoperability where everyone can move in and out freely. Or it may end up a multiverse of walled gardens controlled by different companies accessible only via subscription. But whatever form it takes, we cannot afford to wait and see how things play out in these early versions before preparing and updating legal, regulatory, and other policy frameworks. We have an incredible opportunity right now to learn from the mistakes of the past and think about the policy settings that will promote safety, privacy, security, inclusivity, participation, and the full range of human rights. As I said before, the intention of AR and VR is to create, create significantly heightened experiences, which may also mean that harms will feel much more visceral and real. The kind of metaverse we want and the kind of metaverse we will end up with will depend entirely upon us. And this starts with the architecture we create to enable in government. Thank you, and I now look forward to discussing this fascinating topic further and answering some of your questions in the panel. Thank you so, so much, Commissioner. Commissioner. Uh, it, was, it was a good presentation. And, and now I'll, I'll move on to, to present our panelists and to move to our discussion. Yeah. So I would like to introduce our four panelists for, for today. First, we have Britton Heller. Britton works at the intersection of technology, human rights, and the law. She's currently a fellow at the Atlantic Council with the Digital Forensics Research Lab, examining XR's connection to society, human rights, privacy, and commerce. She's also on the steering committee for the World Economics Forum's Metaverse Governance Initiative. We also have Mark Jamison. Dr. Jamison is a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the director and professor of the Public Utility Research Center and the Digital Markets Initiative at the University of Florida's Warrington College of Business. He conducts research related to the regulation of the information technology sector. We also have Trey Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a lead toxicologist and program manager for the Chemicals, Nanotechnology, and Emerging Materials Program Area in the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction. Dr. Thomas played a lead role in developing the CPSC Nanotechnology Research Program and continues to engage in addressing the health and safety implications of emerging technologies, including virtual re reality devices. Last but certainly not least, we have Sabine Neshke. Sabine is a policy analyst for BPC's business and technology team. She's a published author of a book on science and technology innovations and the importance of scientific literacy on the development of our economy and our future. Before we start the panel discussion, I want to remind all of those watching the webinar to subscribe to ITIF's YouTube channel and to turn on notifications so you never miss an event. 
Also, you can submit your questions using the Slido link down below. And you can also follow the video on the ITIF event webpage. So I want to, uh, Brendan, I want to pick on you. I'm going to start uh, with a question for you. And policymakers across the country have been like heavily pushing age verification laws as a method to protect children from online harm. But enforcing these laws means that platforms will have to collect more data from users, such as government IDs, which those raise, raise a lot of concerns from privacy advocates. How do you think policymakers can balance privacy and safety when thinking about creating the safe experiences for users of metaverse platforms? Thank you, Juan. That's a really good question. And I'm, I, I just wanted to start by saying thank you for having me here today. I, I really appreciate it. I think there are four things that we can do in response to your question. Uh, number one is to apply privacy best practices from the gathering, use, storage, and dis disposal. Oh, no, it seems we um, lost Britain for a second. Uh, are Britain, you able to hear me? It we lost you for a second, uh, right. but I think you're back. Um, right now, we don't have a lot of best practices. There, there are some, and, and this includes on-device storage and limited retention of data for specific uses. Um, and but it's it's more important to to develop these best practices in XR um, because in Can you, I, I believe I, I blinked out Connectivity again. issue, yes. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep talking to you while I uh, make sure that, that this is running off of my Wi-Fi um, and and not my, my, my cellular data. So there we go. Um, it's very important to think about biometrics when you think about XR and to not separate the two because in spatial computing environments, you need to calibrate and input data from the measurements of your body. Uh, other things to think about are, um, are we're basically in the early, early days of XR, even though there's been a lot of hype. So anonymity is less of an issue for users because it's like the early days of the internet where you log in with a verifiable um, billing address with your credit card. So I, I guess to summarize that one, um, given all of the blinking in and out, would be to develop and apply privacy best practices, especially around biometrics when you're looking at XR hardware. Uh, second would be to encourage companies to prioritize safety, especially for vulnerable users. And there was an announcement made by, um, by Meta Reality Labs about an hour and a half ago where they talked about the the new mechanisms that they are are pushing out to prioritize safety for teens. And these include things like age gating mature content, uh, excuse me, age gating mature content, having deep meta horizon profile privacy settings default set to private for teens, making sure that a teen's online status in meta horizon worlds um, will not be shown. So the team will have to choose whether or not their connections can see whether they're active online and which world they're in. Creating a new feature called voice mode, which transforms the voices of a teen, the voices of people that the team may not know into a quiet, friendly, ambient background. And it garbles the teen's voice as well so that people they don't know can't hear them. And this is also turned on automatically um, for all teens by default. So it has to be toggled off. There are mechanisms taken to limit interactions between teens and adults that they don't know. And there's also an expansion of existing VR parental supervision tools. This is this is really good work by the company. I'm, um, I, I know they've been working on it for a long time and I, it actually surpassed my expectations um, because not only have they developed new policies, they've developed new product features to actually enact those policies. Um, I'm, I know I'm running a little short on time, so number three would be to prioritize consent for different experiences and for the sharing of wider data. So remember that to the average user in XR, consent is best translated as user control. 
uh, some of the work that I'm doing with universities across the country are to investigate different types of notice and consent regimes for 3D worlds. Uh, we are looking at different ways that visceral notice, an example of that is rumble strips on a highway instead of like a, you know, <laughs> a notice and consent regime that you click yes to. Um, how can we use the sensory input that distinguishes XR from non-spatial computing to help us control our environment and understand what what we are agreeing to. Uh, we're developing an experiment focused on making users aware that their eyes are being tracked and trying to see if there are different sensory ways that we can do that to really embody the knowledge. Um, you also have different types of consent-based issues that you don't have for non-spatial computing, like bystander notification. If we're supposed to be wearing augmented glasses and other type of wearables, then bystander privacy is going to be as important as user privacy. And finally, to echo Julie's um, excellent point, that we should remember that while the technology is novel, the ability to regulate new innovation is not. And I think we really need to keep in mind that XR will be one part of a new computing ecosystem. So we have to be cognizant and push for privacy protective products and policies in other areas of emerging tech. Otherwise, it's like having um, the little boy who sticks his finger in the dam and uh, while, while other holes kind of pop up behind him. That's the scenario that we really don't want. Uh, I'm a human rights lawyer by training, so concepts like privacy must evolve to encompass new ideas of digital rights. And with that, I think uh, <laughs> it's not a very short answer to your question, but I hope it's a very thorough one. Thank you, Vredin. Uh, I'm going to pull a, a thread you, you mentioned to, to direct this question to Dr. Jamison, and it's it's about anonymity. And, and some as some of your previous work has already highlighted, like the anonymity that virtual identities provide, and especially in place like the metaverse where you can have like a whole build a whole digital identity that is detached from the real world that can sometimes feel anti-social behavior online such as abuse harassment or racism and like the immersive nature of the metaverse could make this anti-social behaviors more harmful for those users that are being aggravated in comparison to that 2d social media but there's like a great value in anonymity and how it can protect free speech. So, so how do you think developers and platforms in, in the metaverse can balance those competing priorities with, with anonymity? Do you think the metaverse will shift the way developers think about user safety when they tackle these issues? Well, Juan, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here to, to talk with this group and congratulations to the commissioner for the, for the wonderful work that, that she's doing. It's, it's tough work. Uh, to uh, to try and set standards for things that we're not yet experiencing, and you know we're all humans, so um, mistakes will be made. But the question will be, how do we deal with the mistakes? How do we adapt when when things uh, when things change on us? And and I'll return to that in just a moment. Let me talk directly to the question you you raised, and that is, what about this anonymity? Yeah, anonymity is important for for people who are threatened. Uh, for people who are, are minimized, people who need to, in order for their own safety, to be able to hide their identities from time to time. That anonymity is really, really important. And it's important for people's own growth sometimes as well, just to try some different things. But um, as we all know, we've all been to school before, we've experienced or seen bullies, and we know that bullies are basically cowards. And they will hide. And uh, if you put them in a place where they can hide their identities, they will engage in more bullying and more bad acts than, uh, than they would otherwise. So it, it becomes a, a difficult situation. And it's something where we're not going to know the answers, and it may not be just one answer. We're not going to know the answers in advance. It may not be just one. It may be a diversity of answers. So we might find that some platforms just simply say, no anonymity. If you need anonymity, anonymity, this isn't the place for it. There are some other platforms where you can do that. There'll be some that'll try and say, yeah, anonymity is a great thing. Please go ahead. And there'll be variations along the way. And that's part of that, that key to adaptation. For, for all of our development, for all of our, our growth, the thing that really makes humans different is our ability to think and adapt. And that's gonna be key here. And, and so as governments think about what will they regulate, 
They need to be careful about, are they going to put boundaries on and borders on that prevent some of the adaptations that are really going to be important? And as the companies will have to try it as well. You know, I, I think in terms of, I think in terms of, of having a family, you know, people will develop a partner or, or get married and, and start a family. And that, that first choice is really, really critical uh, to how well that family develops. But the most critical thing, according to all the research, is how do you adapt when things change? Because the world is going to change. And maintaining that adaptability, that um, saying, okay, I don't know exactly what the future holds, but I have some basic principles. I'm going to hold to those, and I'm going to adjust as, as new realities uh, present themselves. So I think it's critical for the businesses, for the governments as well, to let the future unfold, understand there are going to be mistakes along the way, and the real question is going to be, how are we going to pivot when we find the mistakes we've made? Thanks so much, Dr. Tennyson. So I'll, I'll pivot to, to Sabine. Sabine, I feel like you, we can agree that like platforms of developments, uh, developers in, in, in AR, VR are facing, facing a very difficult challenge. Because I think with, with the 2D experience, users and, and policymakers are demanding this, this providers to make a more, have a more proactive hands-on effort to, to ensure safety. But at the same time, the metaverse content is highly individual. It, it includes more closed supposedly private spaces like like your virtual home that will make platform like on hand on moderation feel invasive how do you think platforms can navigate that trade-off to to ensure a, a safe experience but allowing those private spaces to remain private and, and, and intimate as they should be yeah thank you for this question um i just want to quickly say thank you for having me here and for hosting this conversation around user safety uh, it's just so important that we address these issues now uh, so safety can be built into the design policies and frameworks from the beginning um, back to your question navigating these trade-offs between user safety and privacy speaks to the tensions we're facing around content shared on many online spaces uh, we see this dichotomy playing out in a number of policy areas that we're working on at bipartisan policy center for example, content moderation issues demonstrate this tension where platforms and policymakers understand that it's important for moderation to protect against illegal or harmful content online, but how much content should be removed and for what purposes is still being debated. We also see this around uh, data privacy, artificial intelligence, where Platforms need to collect vast amounts of data in order to detect harmful behaviors or content on their platforms, but this also minimizes the user's privacy. Um, finally, we have to consider that while anonymity and privacy features can protect people who are avoiding harassment or bullies, the same features around privacy may also provide defenses for those doing the harassing. Um, so as policymakers and individuals think through these issues, they just need to carefully consider how these implications apply to immersive environments. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, a more nuanced approach using both hard and soft law um, will have to be considered to balance between ensuring user safety and preserving anonymity and privacy. Thanks so much, Sabine. And, and we'll close out this initial uh, round of questions with yeah. Trey Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission had recently launched a standard technical panel for, for the creation of a safety standard for AR VR products. Can you, can you uh, like walk us through a little bit more, like how are agencies like the CPSC grappling with the challenge of creating a safety standard for such a like nascent technology and, and, and being able to be proactive in tackling potential harms, but towing that line that we do not stifle the development and, and adoption of these technologies? Yeah, uh, thank you, Juan, again, for that question. And as my fellow panelists, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. This is such an important issue. And again, as being in the nascent stages of this technology, it's important that we talk about the health and safety implications. So I'll just start out more broadly. And, and I think the commissioner did such a fantastic job of really bringing you know, so many different points that are critical to this issue uh, for us to consider. 
One is, is this is a very exciting time. We're seeing very rapid advances in technology that are being incorporated into consumer products. So we have the internet of things. We now have products in our homes that are connected to the internet. We have artificial intelligence. Uh, so we have robotics, uh, micromobility. So it's just a, a number of different types of products uh, that are coming onto the uh, onto the market, and so it's it's critical that uh, you know as government agencies that we are aware of what's being commercialized, the changes that are occurring, and then you know your question, how do we address it? Now you mentioned uh, in my your your my biography that I dealt with nanotechnology, and I think that's one of the areas where we really the government pulled together and said we want to do this right, and so we had an initiative. Agencies came together. Uh, for the responsible development of this technology. And I think we're seeing that in these other technologies as well. So, uh, for example, uh, CPSC, we uh, published reports broadly uh, on the type of technologies that I mentioned, uh, where it's, it's looking at the future hazards, not only trying to understand what these technologies are, how they change consumer products, but also what are their potential health and safety uh, implications. Uh, we've also formed, for example, uh, their interagency groups. And again, I'm talking more broadly, like on, for example, IoT, uh, where, you know, agencies come together and discuss how, how are we going to regulate, you know, these new technologies? Sometimes it's not always clear uh, who has regulatory authority. So it's, it's critical that we sit down and understand uh, where the authorities are. And some of the some of these uh, technologies offer new challenges in terms of regulation. Uh, also, uh, meetings uh, we need to engage with our stakeholders. Uh, health and safety is not just the regulatory agencies; it's all of our stakeholders, the manufacturers, our consumer groups, the public, uh, academics, researchers. And so, do we have meetings? So, for example, we've had meetings on AI. Uh, webinar where we allowed folks to, we brought the, the latest uh, research in, in terms of safety, but also uh, the, the leading researchers and hear from those who have expertise in the area so that we are informed. And uh, just informal discussions with our colleagues at federal agencies we talk, and this is specifically in the area of VR, you know, where we have cross-jurisdictional issues. We talk and engage and understand where the hazards and uh, what we can do, not only within the U.S., but also globally. Uh, I participate in meetings with our uh, European colleagues, for example, where we've talked about how we will regulate and the safety implications. Uh, and again, so that is a very important tool. and. Uh, to, to assist us in, in uh, understanding globally, because it's a global marketplace. Uh, you know, uh, products are imported. So I think it's good to think about that if we can uh, understand in the global area how, uh, you know, these products are being regulated. And then finally, a volunteer, you know, the standards development, I do want to correct you, we're part of a standards development group and that is, and, and with these standards, you know, stakeholders can participate, not only manufacturers, but uh, members of the public and NGOs. So it's critical that we develop these safety standards. And this is, there are ongoing activities uh, within uh, VR and, and AR uh, to de develop standards that manufacturers can follow and ensure, you know, address the uh, safety imp implications of their products. So it's really a, a, a monumental effort, but I think that I have certainly seen with collaboration and, and focus, uh, we can uh, really work to improve products and uh, product safety. Thanks so much, Dr. Thomas. And and now uh, let's like I want to open the floor with some some questions. We're probably going to start this one, uh, this one more and ask the commissioner directly. Uh, something that you mentioned in your keynote, and it's it's very tight. It's like the AR VR content tends to be consumed in a way that is like highly personal and individual. Like you participate in this world as, as yourself. You process this content in a way that is unique unique to you as a user. Something that us like those who work in AR VR like talk, they call it embodiment. And, and that means that content that could be de deemed harmful for one person 
could be completely harmless for, for another. And developers have tried to tackle these this differences by, by focusing on individual content tools, like some of the, you mentioned, like the safe zone or blocking and mute buttons. Um, but some some people in the safety uh, uh, in, the, in the safety sphere complain that this puts an unfair burden on users. How do you think developers can tackle content moderation and, and safety in a world that is based so heavily in individual perception? Yeah, and harms are perpetrated individually. Um, that's why we talk about targeted harassment. Um, and it, it's funny because you know there there have been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the way that um, we at eSafety tackle individualized harms, but it's precisely the way that the platforms have to tackle harms as well. It, it's about an individual, and I think. Um, while these experiences in the metaverse and even today might be individualized, I think the trauma and the serious harms experienced at the individual level is often universal. So I think getting definitions and that the um, proper threshold um, for intent to harm and understanding what those harms are really important. So for example, a sexual assault in the metaverse would likely be just as traumatic um, and violating from one user to the next. And as I mentioned, harassment, abuse, cyberbullying are likely to have a far more visceral impact in more immersive environments. Uh, we did some really interesting research called Mind the Gap, where we spoke to 5,000 children and their parents. And I think as we, we all know who are working in this space, in the, the, on, the online and offline worlds of children today are they're totally interconnected, whereas we as their parents may compartmentalize quite a bit more. So um, we, we have found that um, children and young people are engaging in more help-seeking behaviors. So seven years ago when I came into this job, only 50% of kids would talk to a trusted adult when something went wrong. It's now up to 70%. But what was shocking is that um, when a child um, confided in their parent about cyberbullying, only half of their parents remember the conversation because, you know, it's kind of like, oh, you know, digital digital stones won't break your bones, you know, just let it roll off your back. You know, it, 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 it doesn't impact impact you. I think we need to think about the way that, that kids are living their full lives in the real world and online and more and more virtually, and we won't be able uh, to disaggregate the two experiences. So again, I think this is where companies need to be taking a safety by design approach now and anticipating harm and trying to engineer them out or build those guardrails as much as possible. And by the way, it's a continuous journey. It's not a destination. Um, you know, even if you look at the, the um, open AI safety charter and the um, approach that they're taking, um, you know, there's some pretty interesting admissions there that, you know, people will find imminently creative ways to misuse technologies that even the smartest people developing this technology cannot anticipate. So it, it's, and rather than playing a game of whack-a-mole, I think it's also important to remember that while harms do indi manifest individually, they collectively have an impact on society and, are, and can certainly tear at the threads of democracy as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, Sabine, I want to bounce this question to, to you too and love to get your perspective. I know BPC and, and you particularly have done a lot of work in, in content moderation. I'd love to have, have your insight in like, yeah, how do you think like platform can tackle like community-based content moderation in something that is so individual and granular? Yeah, and building off what the commissioner said, users are often representing themselves in these virtual worlds. So everything they experience is unique to their own perception. Um, what one user might perceive as harmless might be harmful to, harmful to another. So, um, you know, inclusivity in building and determining these standards is going to be important to ensure that these different perspectives and concerns are taken into account from the beginning. Um, so this means engaging with users that may be disproportionately affected by harmful content, such as communities of color, members of LGBTQ plus community, um, or individuals with disabilities. But platforms, you know, content moderation, reporting policies, uh, you know, tra better transparency around these, clearly indicating uh, what their rules are and continually updating these rules to reflect the concerns of users will be really important. 
Thank you, Sabine. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Dr. Thomas, because uh, we, right now we've been talking about content moderation and software, but I think the problem of the individuality of ARVR also shows up in, in hardware and, 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 the, and, and the kind of things that the CPSC looks into. Like those potential physical harms of like by using these devices, like for example, depending on their weight, the interpupillary distance of the devices or skin irritation due to materials in which like the headset is made of, uh, respond very differently depending on the individual. So can you walk us through like how this the CPC goes to review this this products in, in this way and that determine where like and act in a way like it is proactive to to block these harms but allow allow this product to to experiment and, and try different things yeah as I mentioned you know there is the standards of developing voluntary standards efforts that will address uh, many of these different issues but I think it's important to look at and I think it Again, VR is so exciting, but that you're wearing devices, you know, literally on the body. And I think this idea of biocompatibility, not just with VR, but I think with so much wearable technology, we now see, you know, these electronics. If we I always like to think of it in the old days, you had a large television sitting in the corner. And over the years now, we become much more uh, intimate with our electronic devices uh, that they're literally you know, worn on our bodies. So one thing we have to consider are, you know, again, the types of hazards. And within CPSC and specifically my group, we tend to look at divide and the type of hazards. You mentioned the chemical, there are mechanical hazards. You're literally wearing this and and Juan, you mentioned, you know, what about the weight of the device or our bodies? What type of physical hazards can occur with the muscular and skeletal systems? Uh, the uh, electronics, you know, uh, are there fire, any fire hazards? And again, it's not just for VR as we look at any. You have, you know, energy storage within batteries and so forth. So what happens there? So I think as we're doing, we're beginning to look at the different components, the different types of hazards, and ensuring that, um, you know, that we are, there are appropriate safety standards that, that can address those hazards. I also think, too, communication as we have, uh, as any new technology, it's, it's uh, you know, encourage consumers, users to communicate if there are any injuries or, or harms that are, that are experienced to, to communicate with the manufacturer and distributor of these devices as well as the regulatory agencies. If we have this information, then we can sooner identify if there are any potential hazards and, uh, and, and be able to address them as early as we, we possibly can. But I think, again, just finally, you know, the word trying to prognosticate and let's be proactive. I think that that is, and I go to my earlier comments where we're discussing with our stakeholders and other agencies, can we begin to identify uh, where these uh, hazards are? So that's an ongoing area that we need for VR and other uh, emerging technologies. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And I'm going to incorporate a question from Q&A uh, that, that I think is very interesting, particularly to you, Britain, as we were talking about ch child safety in AR, VR. So the, the, they ask us, uh, how safe is safe enough for children in AR, VR? Uh, they say that really bad things also happen in that offline world. So it, it's the problem the people instead of the tech. Uh, and I, I want to get your insight on, on this audience question. I, that's a really well phrased question. I, I think the problem is that we don't know what we don't know. And by that, I mean that there's still not enough research done about how being in a virtual world impacts a child's um, cognitive development or spatial development or um, like psychosocial development. People are just starting to do research into some of these areas because no, nobody wants to make their kid the, the guinea pig, right? Um, but there are in some initial studies that have come back that, that talk about how you know, a, a child has, has a difficult time telling the difference between something that is imaginary and something that is real. And that, and that distinction comes with maturity, but it's, it, it's more acute in a virtual world. The, the type of approach that I, I think would be valuable for child safety would be pulling from the EU's um, 
risk-based analysis that they use for AI regulation. And with that, um, when we do know more, then being, then specific use cases could be kind of moved up and down in the hierarchy of risk that could be developed. And that would not that would be a good way to approach this because the hardware floor still isn't set yet. I'm very interested in um, in in a lot of the studies that that are still coming out and how the the new information around generative AI, which I believe is going to be used to create content and populate um, XR worlds, how, how that is also going to implicate children's rights. And I haven't really heard a lot of um, discussion around that yet. Under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, children do have rights. So when we are writing laws that implicate children, we should be looking at that explicitly. Yeah, I mean, can I just weigh in there with generative AI? Um, we're dealing with so many different layers there and potential misuses we've already seen, you know, that child sexual abuse imagery can be um, created. Uh, I think a lot of concern is around the conversational AI um, and the powers of potential m manipulation. So through some of our reports, we're just seeing um, huge spikes in sexual extortion, um, obviously grooming of children, um, even scams, any form of social engineering where you can now almost discern by the naked eye whether, you know, that this is a scam. Um, with generative AI, the manipulative power of these conversational models are going to be awesome. And of course, the inability to differentiate between um, a deep fake porn, deep fake porn, for instance, created by generative AI. I mean, we've got to be honest that the detection tools and the watermarking tools seem to be um, lagging behind, you know, letting this and democratizing this technology and getting this out into the wild. Um, seen some positive things around TruePic and, and, and others, kind of, um, even Adobe doing some work around the content authenticity initiative and making sure that they're training um, their language models on, on content that, you know, isn't copy, they're not violating copyright, um, you know, looking at things like bias. There's just, this is just so rife for so many issues. Um, and so the potential for things to go so wrong. I, I'm going to add one final point because um, there's also the potential for things to go right, and I feel like we don't talk about that enough. Yeah. Uh, the one of the um, the first FDA approved use of XR hardware is actually to treat lazy eye in children, and that needs to be done before a child hits the age of six. The challenge comes when when that regime bumps up against other administrative and regulatory regimes, and the hardware is graded for 13 plus. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and oh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, just chime in on that. Um, I just reading yesterday um, at the University of Florida, we have uh, some scientists that are working on using virtual reality to help autistic children, and they're getting some great successes. Um, there's there's a lot of positive things out there. And so the and so a risk case a risk based analysis of that would look different than a child engaging in a social environment because um, one is kind of a hardware versus software like distinction I I, I would think. Yes, and, and Dr. Jamison, as we're exactly in this in this conversation and child child safety, I think the audience put, puts a very good question. It's uh, how how can parents who don't understand the metaverse help their kids navigate these complex safety questions? Uh, should companies take on responsibility for parents, or like how do you think we can navigate this area where you have a generation maybe it's not as tech savvy with a extremely tech tech technically complex world as is the AR VR world? Yeah. Uh, great question. I, I think there are two things in that. One is that there is a market for companies that build platforms that are very, very friendly for people that aren't tech savvy. Um, you know, in the early days of, of computers, Apple was great at this. this. That was that was their market. You didn't have to be a techno, technical expert to use that Macintosh computer or to use your iPhone or anything else. So there's, there's going to be spaces where the companies step in and say, I, I will help you with that. Um, 
But as with the physical world or any other part of our lives, parents have an obligation to learn everything they can. Um, uh, two, two things um, in that, things I've told my own children and, and things I tell young parents now. So my own children, I told them as they were growing up, as soon as they were able to understand it, and I've kind of got my hands around you to protect things from happening to you and to give you the freedom to kind of bump around a little bit. As you get older, my hands grow farther and farther out there because you learn from those bumps. You learn from all the difficulties. We don't learn from easy things. We learn from really hard things. It's just a question of how far does the parent take that? Now, of course, you know, government isn't the parent, so we actually flip that over and say, well, the government's going to try different things, too. So I'm glad Europe is trying its things. The U.S. will try something different. Australia will try something different, and we'll all learn from each other in that. Other thing that I, I explain to young parents when they, you know, they've got their two-, three-year-old child and going, God, I make so many mistakes. This is just so horrible. I say, well, look, what you're teaching your child is how to be an imperfect person, trying to be a perfect person in an imperfect world. That is what we're facing here as well. Um, we're going to struggle, we're gonna have some amazing times and we're gonna have some really difficult times. And that struggle is something that each generation is going to have. And we just need to learn how to and help others learn how to deal with that well. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Jamison. And with probably a lot of the last questions of of today, uh, Sabine, I'm going to whack back at you and other audience question. It's uh, related to something we've talked already with age verification. It's what should be done to address kids accessing VR and VR content that they're not supposed to. How do you think we can bolster age verification, like tackling some of the challenges that we've brought forward on anonymity and, and, and the constitutionality of it even? Yeah, and we're seeing a lot of alignment around protecting children and teens from the dangers online. Um, which is why we're seeing child privacy legislation increasing at the federal and state level. Um, we are also see, can expect a lot of interesting technological developments by industry in this area. Stakeholders strive to create safe online spaces. Um, age verification is one method that policymakers are considering to address these dangers. However, with proliferation of data minimization, data collection limitation policies, such as biometric data collection, um, age verification becomes really difficult. So you also see a lot of innovation on privacy enhancing technologies such as encryption or anonymization techniques that can be used to protect user data while still enabling age verification requirements. Um, but this is not a simple task. Um, so addressing these concerns is going to take a lot of time and research like Britain mentioned. Um, so for industry and policymakers to effectively address children's safety, um, we're going to have to you know, continue to work together and develop these policies and standards um, over time. Right. And, and I think uh, as, as, as we're coming to time and, and I want to bounce this one, I think we, we can we can go with the commissioner again, just just to finish. And and someone asks in, in the audience, like, how do you make those decisions between what seems to be like the big trade off between freedom and safety? As, as you said, Web one and and what it was praised with the explosion of Web one and Web two is like how the internet opened a space for creativity and freedom of expression, but has also brought up a lot of safety concerns and online arms. How, how do you do you tackle that trade off? I think there's still a tremendous amount of freedom um, online. And it really, I think it comes down to a balancing of a range of fundamental rights. Um, and, um, you know, and again, I think standards of harm, which are always going to be slightly subjective about what, you know, you may have unbridled freedom of speech, but when it um, veers into um, targeted online abuse designed to um, silence me and suppress my free speech rights. You know, it's it's never going to be easy. It's always going to be difficult. I do think they can coexist, but but part of being feeling being in safe spaces gives you the freedom to speak, particularly if you're from a marginalized community. And it, I don't think it's any. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a coincidence that women or those with intersectional factors um, in, in Australia, Indigenous Australians, those in the LGBTQI plus community, those with a disability um, are 
two times more likely than the general population to receive online hate speech, racism, online misogyny. It's designed to silence voices. So um, undermining someone's safety can be used as a means to limit their freedom of expression. And on that great note, uh, and in that powerful statement, uh, as we're 30 seconds off uh, the time, I want to wrap up the conversation and I want to thank the Commissioner, Britton, Sabine, Trey, and Mark for joining us today. Really uh, just an applause for, for you. I think a lot of great insightful conversation. Uh, for those that want to revisit this conversation, and I'm pretty sure everyone in the policy space would like to, you can find this recording on ITIF's YouTube channel, our LinkedIn page, and our Facebook page. And if you want to keep up with uh, ITF's latest insights into AR, VR, and other tech policy discussions, make sure to follow us on social media. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You.